Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I would like uh, to warmly welcome you uh, all to the seventh book club organized by Ceylon College of Physicians. And uh, the book club is the concept uh, of Dr. Arosha Disanaika, uh, Prof. Arosha who is the president of Ceylon College of Physicians. So I would uh, like to uh, ask Prof. Arosha Disanaika to introduce the speaker for tonight. Uh, she's Dr. Avanti Pereira, who is the uh, Deputy Solicitor General uh, at the Attorney General's Department of Sri Lanka. Would you, Prof. Disanaika, to, to introduce our speaker? Right. Uh, a very good evening to all. All uh, there are the CCP Book Club members as well as uh, the CCP General Membership, as well as some other people who uh, who have seen the link and who are planning to join in. So a warm welcome to all of you. Uh, it is a pleasure to have you at the CCP Book Club. We usually have physicians or doctors talking about books which have made an impression in their lives or which has changed the way that they work or look at life. That was the objective when we started the, the book club, not merely to read, but to share with others uh, thoughts on books, which made them, they feel better at what they were doing. But occasionally we invite an author of a book to speak to us about the book. Now you may recall Previously, we had Herman Malingagun Ratna talking about tea industry in Sri Lanka. And this evening, it is my great pleasure and privilege to welcome Dr. Avanti Pereira to our midst to talk about her book on medical negligence. Uh, Avanti has a very impressive CV, and I'm going to read uh, parts of her CV. Uh, I, I know that Avanti is not very uh, keen on this, but I think it's important that the audience uh, is aware of who Avanti is and what her work has been. Dr. Avanti Pereira holds, a, uh, she has a doctorate in law from the University of Oxford. She has a master's from the University of Cambridge in international law. Uh, and then she has her basic degree from the University of Colombo, where she actually uh, graduated in English. Uh, with a, She passed with a first class. Then, of course, she has been with the Attorney General's Department and uh, she has been in the forefront in looking at the interface between medicine and law. Uh, she's attended and as resource person for a number of uh, World Health Organization organized initiatives, both locally and internationally, to share her expertise on, on medical negligence and other aspects of law related to health. Then she authored this book about which she's going to speak to us today. Uh, it was published in 2016, uh, Medical Negligence Claims in Sri Lanka. Now, the idea is that uh, we are, most of us are in the audience are doctors and uh, perhaps the worst experience a doctor could have is uh, Medical, medical negligence claim made upon them. Uh, it is important to understand why people seek refuge in, or at least they seek, uh, seek compensation or fairness through the law. And where do we fail to meet expectations of, of patients? From what I know, uh, Avanti has studied about 40 or even more such instances. And her findings will definitely help us to understand why this happens and perhaps hopefully make patients feel better so that there will be less problems for them and for us as well. Avanti has made a number of presentations at medical forums also. This is not the first time she's uh, back in 2019. I invited her to Gaul when I was president of the Gaul Medical Association to speak to us. And then uh, this is actually following on from that. I thought it is important that the CCP membership gets to share Avanti's views on, on medical negligence. Uh, and then, of course, besides uh, professional commitments, uh, Avanti is the principal violinist of the Symphony Orchestra of Sri Lanka, as well as the Chamber Music Society of Colombo. 
and is the music director of a theater group which does original theater work. I very casually mentioned to Dr. Pereira, perhaps uh, I'm tempted to ask her to speak about music even more than medical negligence. And then of course she said the only problem is she is unable to write another book on music within a couple of weeks. So that was, so maybe if and when she writes the book, we will invite her to speak about that. For the time being, just uh, uh, as, as a parting comment for this introduction, back in 2019, uh, I, I spoke to uh, Honorable uh, Justice of the Supreme Court, Yasanta Kodagoda, and asked, sought his opinion on, on somebody to speak about medical negligence to doctors. And what he said was, Dr. Avanti Pereira, he suggested the name and said she is the foremost authority in Sri Lanka on medical negligence. So that is how highly she is uh, regarded within the legal fraternity of Sri Lanka. Coming from uh, Justice of the Supreme Court, that was his thought on Avanti's work. So it is a great pleasure and a privilege to have her with us, speaking to us about her book and what we could perhaps learn from her documentation of medical negligence in Sri Lanka. That has been a long introduction, but I just wanted to have the setting appropriate over to you, Madhuvanti and Navanti, to carry on the rest of the uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Zisana for those uh, words of introduction on Dr. Avanti Pereira. And uh, without further ado, I think uh, we'll uh, ask her to start her talk. Over to you, Dr. Avanti. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much, Prof. Zisana for that very generous introduction. Uh, and also uh, uh, Dr. Hityarachi for moderating this event. Um, uh, when I was asked to speak, uh, I readily agreed and I'm glad that there is still interest in this book that I wrote uh, so many years ago. Uh, but of course, since then, uh, Sri Lanka is now basking in the glory of a Booker Prize win. And I was wondering, perhaps it should be Shahan Karunatilaka speaking about the seven moons of Mali Almeida who should be here and not me on a boring book, uh, academic book on medical negligence. Uh, but as I say, I'm always willing to share my experience, my writing uh, of the book. So really what I want to take you through is not just the contents of this book, but my experience of writing it and, uh, and, and, and uh, what I hope that it would achieve uh, and I hope it has achieved something in the years that it's been there for the last eight, eight or so years, and that it would be of some contribution to the field in the um, coming years. Now I'm going to share my screen. Uh, Madhuanti, you can see the screen now? Yes, we can. Yes. yes. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, so really, uh, medical negligence claims in Sri Lanka. So it's not uh, medical negligence in Sri Lanka. This was important to me, uh, particularly when I uh, gave my thesis, which is what this book is born out of, uh, that this was not merely about law or medicine, but there was a dispute perspective in it. It's about the claiming process. Uh, and it goes beyond the two disciplines of medicine and law. Uh, so at the time I uh, embarked on my research in 2007, I began my doctoral studies. Uh, in Sri Lanka, the seminal case, and if ever you mention the words medical negligence, was always the Priyani Soisa versus PNCR Skularatna case which was the only medical negligence litigation which reached the apex court, that is the Supreme Court, and therefore became a binding judgment on this area of law. It was a very niche area because as, as I progress with what is in my book, you will see that not many people do proceed to litigate on this subject as they do on perhaps property, or fundamental rights actions, et cetera. So medical, neg neg medical negligence litigation was very rare at that time. And this really was the name, the, the, the name that, one, that sprung to mind if medical negligence was ever spoken of. 
And then besides, so that was the legal perspective because the Supreme Court made its pronouncement on that. And then a couple of years afterwards came Professor Colvin Gunaratna's book, A Doctor's Quest for Justice, which was actually a critical analysis of those judgments uh, of in the Priyani Soisa case, because there were actually three judgments. It was first litigated in the district court, the, which was actually in favor of the, of the claimant. Then it went up to the court of appeal, again, in favor of the patient, uh, the father. And then of course, in the Supreme Court, it overturned the decision of the Court of Appeal. Uh, and uh, Priyani Soisa was held not to have been negligent, uh, uh, not, to have, well, not to have been negligent in that case, uh, which uh, would cause her to pay compensation had she been found uh, guilty of that charge. So here was I with uh, a very uh, talked about seminal legal uh, case, and then another book, which also drew a lot of interest. And it's a very well-written book uh, because it's, although it's written by a doctor, I mean, Professor Colvin Gunratna also guided me a lot in my own book. And even after it was published, he, he commented on it. Uh, th there's a lot of uh, interpretation from the medical perspective, as well as a legal perspective coming from a, a, a medical, uh, medical professional. So that, that was where it stood. Uh, so quite apart from this discipline of law, and then on the other hand, medicine, there was something that was missing at the time. And that really was a sociological aspect to all of this. And this is where I suppose my book finds some space to be of interest. Uh, because even when I applied to do my PhD studies at Oxford, uh, I was accepted to what was the cent, what is called the Center for Social Legal Studies. So it was not really the law faculty, but this specialized center which deals with law in society. And that really is the study of the intersection between the disciplines of law and sociology, on the other hand. So it requires an empirical study of the law. Often what we know as the study of the law is reading case law, judgments, uh, analyzing very much uh, written literature on the subject. Uh, but not much is done in terms of researching law as it is practiced in society. So when we speak of law in society and as an empirical study of the subject, we are actually deconstructing what is considered as law itself. I mean, law, that's, that's why I have put it here as, as capital L, L-A-W. It is not law, but it is deconstructed into law or laws because different communities, different societies will perceive what is law in a different way. So it's almost a bottom-up approach where you go into society and first try to understand what it is that society even considers as the law and then work your way upwards and also then see whether traditional law mechanisms uh, uh, are reconciled with those concepts or whether there are contradictions or, or they actually cater to what people expect of the law. So is law just it, would someone say law is merely obeying a traffic light, for instance, or is the law the constitution? Is the law the customs that the Vadba community observe? So it, it becomes this simple L law or laws and not the law. And of course, for a study, an empirical study of the law, you have to use methods which are normally used in sociology. So that means social, social scientific techniques like, such as qualitative and quantitative research. Uh, and then once you get that data to either of those processors or both of those processors, you adopt either a positivistic uh, approach or an interpretive method to data analyze uh, and, and analyze that data or, or again both. And I, I adopt a, a mixture of all of this in my research. And, and as I take you through the book, that will become obvious. Then, of course, what is the contribution of such a study 
in a social legal discipline. On the one hand, it has a theoretical value because it helps to generate or develop theories about law in practice and also inform the policy process. Then on the other hand, which I think is far more important really because it goes beyond the academic, is a practical value. And that is to influence policy on the provision of legal services. Uh, and in, in this case, I, I hope that my book also informs and influences policy on the provision of medical services. Um, sorry, I need to go back to the slides. Yeah, so if I juxtapose those aspects of social legal studies, you will see in the introduction, this is the introductory uh, paragraph in chapter one of my book, I will just read it. Medical negligence has traditionally been the subject of discussion from the point of view of the two most obvious disciplines it involves, medicine and law. However, the invocation of medical negligence in a claims or dispute perspective context involves a third perspective from which the subject can be discussed, a sociological, if not socio-legal one. Lloyd Bostock, Bostock and Mulcahy, these are two pioneers in social legal studies, see hospital complaints, which can include medical negligence claims, as social episodes where hospitals are called to account for violation of complainants' normative expectations and make their responses. Adapting their idea, the analysis in this book treats medical negligence claims as social episodes, each of which is caught in the midst of a dispute journey and part of a larger process involving its participants' understandings of, explanations of, and responses to healthcare service standards. It situates itself in a particular social legal microcosm and seeks to understand the extent to which the medical negligence claims landscape in Sri Lanka reflects concerns about healthcare service standards in the country. So what is the focus of my book? So we assume that we, we, if, we, if we were to embark on a traditionally legal uh, analysis of the subject, you would assume that medical negligence is about uh, substandard care uh, or, or uh, not adhering or not being compliant with the accepted practices of medical care and falling short of that, which then causes some injury and then leads to some harm and then uh, results in damages being claimed for that harm. So that's a very legal definition of what medical negligence is. But what are medical negligence claims really about? Although the legal definition of medical negligence involves, as I said, the failure of healthcare service providers to exercise the standard of due care, empirical findings from a qualitative case study set in Sri Lanka demonstrate that medical negligence claims do not straightforwardly represent the same concern. This is primarily because each such claim is a singular episode which is caught in the midst of a dynamic dispute journey and is therefore part of a larger process involving, as I mentioned before, its participants' understandings of explanations of it and responses to healthcare experiences. So it's really the emphasis is really, I would think, in all of this is about the dynamism. What starts off as uh, a grievance may not even develop into a claim, or when it does develop into a claim and possibly ends up in a claim forum, may not be, may not reflect the same grievance that it be, uh, that it that 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 was the starting point of that grievance. Uh, so it, it, it's a very evolving process. Uh, and so it's very difficult to capture it at each of these points. But as, as Professor Bisan I mentioned, I, I studied 40 claims and I caught them at different places in their dispute journeys. Uh, they were all claims which were either ongoing or, or had concluded, but each of them um, uh, brought some perspective as to what those claimants were experiencing at each point of their journey. So the book explores and explains the complex presence and absence of concerns about healthcare service standards within the medical negligence landscape in Sri Lanka. 
So the book is divided. This is from the content stage, just the introduction. And then I will take you through these, the main chapters, which is the first one I would think is the identity of parties and emergence of grievances. The next chapter, I look at what, what is really in those grievances, the substance of those grievances. The, the fourth one, chapter is on dispute conditions and grievance management. The fifth one, which I think is, to me, is the most interesting, is the goals pursued by claimants. The sixth one is the claims forums and the capacity to claim. The seventh one is claims processing and outcomes via legal forums. By that, I mean courts. And the eighth one, is a claims processing and outcome via non-legal forum. So any, any forum to a forum which is approached by a person who's aggrieved and who becomes a claimant of medical negligence, but who doesn't go to a court, but approaches some other uh, forum. So the research methodology, methodology uh, and database that I had to use, uh, as I said, uh, it's uh, has to. Um, it's driven by uh, social, social, uh, sociological techniques uh, in, in the social science field. So I did a qualitative study uh, because I wanted to know why and how patients or their next of kin, if the patient had died, of course, responded to medical negligence because perceptions and the making of meaning was essential to my investigation. But of course, there is also, I adopted some uh, quantitative analysis on certain issues, consumer awareness, perceptions of healthcare services in general, an attitude towards the law and perceptions of medical negligence litigation. So uh, Professor Disan, I can mention this as well. My main source of data were these 40 medical negligence claims which had either been concluded or were ongoing disputes, either before civil lawsuits or before the district courts or criminal investigations before the police. Inquiries, because there's a complaint uh, hearing mechanism in the Ministry of Health. Then of course, uh, the Sri Lanka Medical Council, uh, which entertains applications um, or, or it has to be in the form of affidavit if somebody is aggrieved by a doctor's uh, care and private hospital claims managers, because if, if medical negligence happens, it takes place in the private uh, healthcare sector, then each of those hospitals would have uh, a system to deal with those claims. Then I also relied on other sources of data. So that was, so have, those 40 claims were obviously actual claimants. Then there are potential claimants because that is the entire gamut of the patients in Sri Lanka. But because any time, any point or at any point of time, some of some might experience uh, an adverse event, and they could become claimants. So I conducted with them structured interviews. So I went to uh, eight hospitals. Uh, so they they. Uh, represented the public, as you can see, uh, Kalubovila, Karapitiya, Nigambo, Ratnapura. So that was the public health care sector. Uh, then Sri Jayavadanapura, semi-government, and of course, uh, three uh, private hospitals as well. RCD, uh, Durdens, one is missing there perhaps. Um, yeah, I forget actually to which I went. I'm sorry, I haven't put that on the screen. Um, then I also interviewed professional and civil society stakeholders, because I knew if I solely relied on patients, uh, what I would get is a somewhat one-sided view. So to balance it out, I had interviews with the policymakers, of course, the Minister of Health at the time, then officials from the Ministry of Health, then high rank administrators of hospitals, representatives from several bodies of medical professionals, including the SLMC, the GMOA, and Lanka Medical Protection Guarantee Limited. And my own colleagues, state counsel from the AG's department and judges who had experience of medical negligence litigation. And also informants from the medical legal academia, representatives of NGOs involved in patients' interests and rights. Then, or documentary sources, academic literature, obviously legal plans, there was some, it was very difficult because uh, this was a difficult area of studies because there's really no central database to see how many cases are filed. Yes, the Ministry of Health would share with me the number of complaints that were filed in a particular year, but there is nowhere really uh, in the, I'm, I'm sad to say, in the legal fraternity where I 
I wanted to know how many medical negligence claims are pending right now at this moment. I won't be able to find that. There is no central database. So um, unless, of course, they had concluded and there was a judgment like in the case of the, the Priyani Soisa case. And so what I had to do was I had to go to the National Archives and I read newspapers for, during a particular a huge expanse of time really to see the media coverage because that was really one of the ways in which I could trace people to interview. These 40 claimants, uh, I mean, I didn't have a list given to me. I had to find them, I had to literally find them. So if I had, because I work in the Attorney General's department and I had access to, I would know what cases the Attorney General would obviously in, in, in a civil lawsuit would be defending a government doctor or a government hospital. Um, then I would see that legal plaint and the address of the plaintiff would be there. Then I could, I, I have to try to find that. Of, of course, the phone number wasn't there, particularly those days. It was less, less so as well. I mean, uh, uh, so I, I can't even remember how I traced them, but maybe through ad advertisements, if they were in Colombo and not too, not too far away, I actually went and, and found these, uh, found these uh, interviewees. Uh, then, of course, some degree of participation observation as well, because I went and attended some court proceedings along with my colleagues who were defending these cases. And I went for a couple of meetings with patients' rights groups. And I observed some lectures at the medical faculty where the subject of medical negligence was specifically being taught because I wanted to see um, how it is translated and how doctors or, or doctors to be uh, because this is their first, first, um, first introduction. Their introduction to the subject comes at that point and how it is perceived or how it is really taught and what is lacking if, if there was a lacuna. So in that sense, I adopted these various methods of research uh, data collection. So now I will go straight into the content of my book. Uh, as I said, I begin with the identity of the parties and the emergence of grievances. So what am I really looking at? Who are the parties in medical negligence claims? And how do their identities determine whether grievances emerge from healthcare experiences? So one would think of, of, our presumption is that only those with money who can access the legal system or who have money to pay lawyers would be the ones who are aggrieved or perhaps the socially affluent because they care more about their rights and, and have the wherewithal to do something when those, they feel those rights are violated. So these are assumptions which I, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't work with hypotheses. I had to break down or, or work, as I said, bottom-up approach. So I couldn't assume anything. Uh, and I wanted to see uh, uh, amongst those 40 people or even those who uh, in the general cohort of patients who I interviewed, uh, how they uh, looked at or how they, how they would develop a grievance with regard to the healthcare sector. So one, uh, one of the starting points is how much do patients know about healthcare? I mean, this is about information access because one, we would assume that if you have access to more knowledge and now with Google, etc. everybody possibly who, who has access to the internet, even when they are prescribed some medicine, will probably Google that to see whether in fact that is something they ought to be, take, ought to be taking or what are the ingredients of that medication. You would not blindly go perhaps with what the doctor prescribes. Uh, then um, can pa patients access information about adverse events? Because as we all know, and I don't have to be shy to say this amongst the community of medical professionals, uh, as soon as something goes wrong, the, the reaction is to suppress the information so that you avoid, you prevent a claim of medical negligence. Uh, so can patients, do patients really have access to information? Then to what extent do patients trust their doc doctors? Because in order for a party to feel aggrieved, uh, the relationship with the doctor or the healthcare service sector also matters. If you, I mean, it's, it, it's the case in any dispute, really. If it is somebody you trust, somebody you care about, somebody you have an emotional relationship with, then you are less likely to sue them 
or want to go against them or challenge them. So I had to ask patients, what do you normally think about your doctor? What do you think about doctors in general? And so my book, uh, unfortunately, I mean, I had to, much of it perhaps was in singular uh, when I interviewed these patients. So I had to translate it into English so it doesn't, the book may not really capture the nuances with which they describe their relationship with the doctors. But what came across was actually um, still a, a lot of deference and trust and faith in doctors. Then, of course, the question of do patients know of their rights? Uh, as you know, I mean, we have fundamental rights in our constitution. We do not have a right to health, but nor do we even have a right to life. But that has been indirectly recognized in certain cases, like where torture is involved or environmental case, pollution cases are involved. The Supreme Court has held that one can't have a right to uh, right to freedom from torture or right to a clean environment if you first do not have a right to life itself. So right to life, which is expressly recognized in the Indian constitution is only indirectly recognized by jurisprudence in Sri Lanka. So health rights, I mean, patient rights, it's really another, it's even further away from what is uh, recognized expressly. So it's something that has to be articulated. And this on this subject, there is something interesting. There's a case pending. I want to talk about that towards the end of my presentation, because that really takes medical negligence claims out of the district court forum and what we are really familiar with, the private law uh, arena, to the public law, law realm. Then the question of do patients believe that doctors have control over adverse events? Because if, if patients think that or, you know, our hospital systems are overcrowded and uh, they, uh, they almost seem to excuse any adverse event that happened. And they, uh, they have even expressed that, you know, I am not the only patient here. The doctor has to look after other patients. So, you know, what to do? And then this sort of very, uh, uh, I suppose it's a cultural, uh, cultural reaction, sort of this sense that, oh, it's my karma. So, it doesn't matter. It's not something. It's not something that could have been prevented anyway. So all of these seem to mitigate the emergence of grievances. So some will drive it. Some will uh, control it or reduce that. Then of course, what demographic demographic characteristics do those who uh, do uh, are there in people who do claim? So as I said, the assumption is that it will be the socially affluent, the, those who can afford. Uh, but when I actually looked into it, it, it was not the case because it was not only the expensive forum of litigation or courts that were accessible, but as I said, a large number of hundreds of complaints a year to the uh, claims uh, complaints inquiry mechanism in the Ministry of Health. So rightly or wrongly, people are agreed. It, it's easy just send a letter there and hopefully an inquiry will begin. So it was not so not, not uh, confined to those of a particular social economic status that we believed might be the case. And of course, gender driven, what I found was more females seem to be aggrieved. Uh, but as I said, because it's not a quantitative study, I, don't, I think it's dangerous to make that kind of claim that uh, a, a very generalized claim. But in my cohort of research participants, uh, that, that, is, that is what I found. And of course, the younger the person who dies, then the, uh, the, you feel more violated and you feel the need to do something about it because you feel it's a wasted life. So then again, the uh, person who claims uh, the age would depend on that. So then I go to the next chapter, which is the substance of grievances. Now, this is also very interesting and this is where really this interface between law and society comes and also uh, my study of going beyond just law and medicine because if we technically look at, at look at medical negligence as i said i mean we are all familiar with the bolam case the bolito case it's all about uh, not being compliant with the accepted practice uh, medical practice uh, so it has very much to do with clinical uh, 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 clinical care. 
and uh, the grievance has to be then couched in that way if you want to make a claim out of it, which will satisfy uh, a medical negligence claim in court. So it has to be a grievance where you can identify that something has gone wrong in a clinical sense. But when we look at the grievances expressed, so this is so that clinical sense is what was obviously expressed by, let's say, the, the doctors that I interviewed or the healthcare sector professionals or even the state council or the lawyers or the judges, obviously, that is what, when I ask them, what do you think is a grievance which, from which a medical negligence claim would emanate? Their response was obviously that, that clinical perspective. But then the grievances expressed in lay narratives were not always that. And here, I think it's important that I read some of those uh, grievances, uh, how the patients articulated their grievances. So I will read from, this is page 96 of my book. When I complained that the doctor, oh, sorry, when I complained that the patient was in pain, the house officer responded, but do you know, you are not a doctor. I felt like killing him. Another patient says this. I won't be so sad if the doctor had taken some effort. He was arrogant when I requested a cesarean. They just kept me warded and didn't take any notice. Another patient. What I am angry about is that the doctor did not tell me something had gone wrong and went on treating me. I felt cheated. Another patient. The patient started complaining of pain, but the doctors and nurses ignored it. They said it will reduce the next day. When the patient started shivering and I asked why, the house officer was dismissive. He said it was because of the AC. Another person. I knew that my breast milk was not enough for the triplets. So I asked the house doctor to write a prescription for formula milk, but he did not want to take the responsibility and said to wait for the pediatrician the next day. But that doctor did not visit for a couple of days. When I asked them uh, to transfer the babies to a private hospital, it was a humiliation for them. They were rude and delayed the transfer. Another patient. The doctors repeatedly ignored the child's condition. The child vomited blood, but the doctor said it was the apple he had just eaten. Tried to give oxygen for two hours. They did not monitor or look at any damn thing. After that, they said to take to a private hospital. They hurriedly brought some papers and took my signature saying, so that you won't file a case against us. Another patient. When I kept inquiring after my wife's condition, and was showing concern, the nurse responded, you should not mollycoddle her. Another patient, my husband was continuously bleeding. I kept begging the doctor to do something, but he did not take much notice. Another patient, my child was suffering, but the doctors and nurses had no comforting words. Their attitude was absolutely awful. I had to have a lot of patience because I, if I assaulted them, they would have taken trade union action. Another one, the doctor was rude. He did not inspect any child, but gave more attention to other children. He, he did not inspect my child, but gave more attention to other children in the ward who had been transferred from his private practice. And yet another comment. The patient was struggling. There was no doctor in the ward and the nurses had not taken any notice either. Two more. Uh, let me just wrap up this. When I informed the nurse that my doctor was, daughter was in pain, she was very dismissive. She said, you can't come to teach me. She was a horrible nurse. We saw other patients too in the same ward being ill-treated by her. The last one. My father was in pain, but the doctors were rude. They shouted that he should take his turn in the queue. So some of these obviously I've translated from Sinhala to English, some in English, I can't recall which was which. But as you can see, none of these grievances are about the care itself. It is simply about the way that they have been treated. But one would say the bedside manners of the doctors, bedside if there was a bed at all. Uh, but uh, so as you can see, we have this clinical versus non-clinical grievances. So in my conclusions, I, I, what I found was even if there was something clinical and clinical alone, perhaps a patient might not uh, take it as far as a claim. But if it was 
aggravated by this kind of non-clinical grievance because of the response of the doctors or the manner in which a patient was treated uh, in a non-clinical sense, then that would give cause for grievances leading up to a medical litigation uh, claim, which has really nothing to do with medical negligence in its traditional sense. So that gets, to, gets us to the next, uh, next uh, dispute dynamic, and that's dispute conditions and grievance management strategies. Whether and why aggrieved parties consider medical negligence claims as a grievance management strategy, and to what extent does that strategy reflect concerns with healthcare service standards. This is sort of tied up with what I said before, but it goes beyond that. Because some of the other variables, again, all of these, as you can see, have many variables. How intense is the injurious experience? So if it's something like death or the patient, uh, uh, patient, uh, uh, patient becoming, uh, uh, you know, being par paralyzed for life, uh, or if it's a child who is then uh, he's harmed and ca cannot uh, cannot enjoy uh, a quality of life in her, uh, going growing up. Uh, some, so the injurious experience, if it's intense, then obviously you would want to claim more. Then how how do agreed parties relate to the healthcare service sector? So this again is ties in with some of what I said before. What do, do they feel, particularly in the government healthcare sector? I feel. Or oh, what I found was there is you, you you do excuse some of the doctors because they can see that uh, that they are battling uh, really a uh, losing battle uh, with so many patients to treat and giving the best of care. And really, Sri Lanka's healthcare system is is quite a good one. I mean, that's that's recognized worldwide, uh, considering our socioeconomic uh, level in the country. But still, if what we provide is excellent services but uh, you know, lacking in certain aspects, which are probably can be remedied. Uh, so patients are willing to forgive, uh, but not so much perhaps in the private sector because they feel they have paid for care and they, they need to get 100% of the care that they did pay for. And of course, most importantly, that individual doctor-patient relationship. I don't need to say it again, that the lack of that came across in those uh, uh, quotations that I took you all through just before. Then what is the response received from the healthcare service provider? So this is again, very important because as I mentioned earlier, the automatic response is to suppress information, go into this, we will not tell anyone, this is the way to prevent a medical uh, negligence claim from emerging. But really it has the opposite effect because when you don't know anything, when you do not know the truth, then you want to, you want to uh, see what you want to, you want that explanation. You want, you, you go in search of that truth. So if the truth were forthcoming, perhaps then you don't need to, uh, need to invoke a grievance redress mechanism or an inquiry system. Then what is the influence of third parties? Very important. Often it's, uh, it's not just your relatives or the patient themselves who are encouraged to go in for litigation, you will have others saying their own experience, or particularly after the Priyani Soisa case, uh, that, that case became something which encouraged those who probably did not uh, feel like suing people, that case became something that they knew that, yes, perhaps there is some, uh, although, as I said, the Supreme Court judgment uh, did not result in the doctor having to pay damages, Still, it, it was something in mainstream media that everybody was aware of. So that, that influence was there uh, of third parties, so which had nothing really to do with the clinical, the adverse event itself, but all these extraneous issues. And then, of course, how is claiming, including litigation, perceived? Now, this is very important because at the time I was doing my research, uh, the perception of the legal system, and this is not just about medical litigation, negligence litigation, but generally about the legal system was very low. And uh, I, I hope it has changed. I, I cannot comment for obvious reasons, but anyway, this is, these are comments that others made. So I don't think I'm in contempt of court. Uh, so I will read what my informant said. These are not my views, but this is what 
lay people had to say about their experience with the legal sector. Now, I took you all through what they had, what they thought of the medical sector, but here is the legal service sector. I really do hope that I'm not hauled up for contempt of court like Ranjan Ramanayaka, but here, here, here I go. Judges can be bought over. Lawyers can take you for a ride unless you have power and money. There are always loopholes in the law which you can use for your own gain, said one person. Another said, the justice system is the most corrupt system. Terrorism is caused because people take law into their own hands. But you can't do without a legal system. You need to clean up the system right from the top. But the public is also to blame. There must be a sense of personal responsibility. If you complain in these times, you are the biggest fool because you will be abducted. Then another person. I have absolutely no faith in the courts. It is, and I, I say that say it in Sinhalese because I don't, didn't think I could capture it with any English word appropriately. He said, Eka antimai. So I translated it as, as, it, as it works. There is no independence in the police. Lawyers are worse than doctors, but they will both pocket money at the end of a medical negligence case. Another, the legal system bows down to money. Look at the number of bails and acquittals. Only people with money will win, even by deceiving courts. People go above the law because they have no respect for courts or decisions. Most do not have the strength to pursue litigation. Only those with money can, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, for purposes of time, I won't read uh, this, but this is from page 131 and 132 of my book. Um, so just the last comment. There is no point litigating because even if I seek the help of the law, we spend 30 years, a lifetime over it. And sadly, that is really the truth, not just in medical negligence cases, but you have property cases fought by people and the original plaintiffs are dead by the time there are any benefits reaped from a case. Um, so when you perceive that you will not get anything out of claiming, then again, that is something which will discourage you. And you then resolve to grievance management strategies, which are, which, uh, are not, nothing to do with claims. And you will either, as I said, say, oh, this is my karma, I'll have to deal with it. I'm not going to has be hassled by the court system. Then the fifth chapter, goals pursued by claimants. What are the goals of medical negligence claimants? And to what extent do they reflect concerns about healthcare service standards? So again, I, I keep going back to this healthcare service standards because that is what medical negligence should be about. Uh, but, but look at what, what the claimant's goals are. As I said, again, an assumption is that you are money hungry and you are claiming because you want to make some money out of it. But look at this, out of my 40 patients, 24 of them said, of course, some of them cited one or more of these. So that's why these numbers don't add up to 40 and they add up to uh, numerically more. Prevention of recurrence was right there at the top, 24 people, right? Uh, over half. Compensation, yes, 17. Justice, an equal number. An explanation, six. Admission, apology, five. So as you can see, it's a combination of goals. It is certainly not compensation alone. Yes, it could be compensation, as I said, if somebody, a patient has gone into a vegetative state and needs uh, a lot of money for uh, aftercare. Uh, this, I think you can recall the recent judgment of 30 million, the highest ever awarded in the district court. Uh, two weeks ago, or uh, I think uh, September 13th, I'll, I'll uh, speak about that judgment in a, as I conclude this. Um, there are the child, the, the compensation is calculated because the child has to, um, uh, child has, yeah, child needs treatment in terms of uh, aftercare to be looked after because it, she, she's not going to lead a normal life. Uh, so yes, compensation matters to that kind of patient and that kind of injury. But most people, and I think they genuinely, because they didn't need to tell me anything that I, they felt that I needed to hear, they said, make a tower connector novena, right? They didn't want it to happen to another person. So that was what motivated them. So it was almost an altruistic goal that led them to, uh, led them to claim. And then, of course, justice, an explanation, an admission, an apology. Justice, yes, so because you feel you have been wrong, so you need, not so much because you need the money, but you at least want to see that doctor come to court and have something on paper 
recognizing that injustice had been caused to you. And then explanation, admission, apology, I would put all together. This is why it's so important that if these were forthcoming before a claim were made, a claim might not even be made because the explanation might resolve any uh, doubts that uh, uh, an aggrieved party has because he might understand that, yes, this, this was something that could not be avoided. It was unforeseen. The doctors took, did their maximum. Uh, or if they apologize, I mean, having even explained that and say, we apologize, we couldn't do anything more. So it's really about one's response, uh, which will then. So, but unfortunately, claimants will then go as far as uh, court to get these things. Court is not the forum to get any of these goals. Court will only award you compensation. Uh, and very rarely does is uh, a criminal indictment filed for medical negligence because it's a gross medical negligence with a high degree of uh, degree of uh, negligence, which has to be proved in the criminal justice system. And that's really where you get a punitive, uh, a punitive consequence. Uh, so what is the point of approaching any of these forums if all you need but needed was something which those forums can't offer. And uh, these were strong and stable, these non-financial goals were there right to the end, even though that might have, it might have started as that, it didn't change, that prevention of recurrence was there. Um, so I discuss in my book why, why it is that that is important. Then uh, the sixth uh, point, so yes, a person has now decided, yes, I must claim. Then the question is, where do I claim? Whether and where agree parties make medical negligence claim and whether they have a choice of space to reflect concerns with healthcare service standards. So yes, somebody has now decided, yes, I am angry enough. I have a goal I want to claim, but where does he go? So you have these various fora, the court, as I said, then the Ministry of Health, Complaint Inquiry Mechanism, SLMC, Private Hospital Claims Management. Um, but do they really have a choice in these? And are the parties aware of these claims? Well, courts, yes, everybody is aware of. Ministry of Health, obvious choice because that is a government institution. So to write a letter to that doesn't require much effort. You can just fire that off. SLMC had to be an affidavit process. So very difficult. They would, would be rejected if it was not in the particular format, right? Uh, and then private hospital claims, Yes, I suppose one uh, that if the event occurs at a private hospital, your obvious reaction would be to the management there, uh, response. So these are the claims forum. Uh, but can aggrieved parties make use of? So yes, these claims forum are available, but then you must also have resources and other, other variables if you need to really uh, act on it. So number one is, of course, affordability for the court system, as I said, you would need to pay lawyers. So it's an expensive process. So here, even though the aggrieved parties may not be socially affluent and are a cross section, at this point, you find that uh, the claimants will then now become reduced from a cohort of those who want to claim, then the affordability factor will uh, kick in. Uh, then, of course, finding evidence, finding lawyers. There are, I mean, I don't think we have specialist lawyers in medical negligence. Yes, there are some lawyers who, who, are, who do engage in more medical negligence claims than the others, but it's not a specialism that is, uh, it was certainly not there at that time, maybe slowly emerging now, but it is not like you find constitutional lawyers or family lawyers or commercial lawyers. Medical negligence is far too niche. Um, and of course, hospitals have their own lawyers who they always employ. So those lawyers will then never, uh, never appear for a uh, claimant against that particular hospital. And finding evidence, again, tied up with that whole suppression, because how do you access all this information, which the plaintiff would need if they want to file a case? I mean, they can't even find the names of those who treated them. They don't know the doctors. They don't know the nurses. So you want to name a party, which is fundamental, you can't find it. So then you will find a claim against the secretary of the Ministry of Health, a director of a hospital, but may not be the doctor, right? So again, these are, these are factors which reduce one's capacity to claim. Then the next two chapters, one I deal with the 
claims processing and outcomes in legal forum. And the other next one I deal uh, with all those other ones that I mentioned, which are out of court. So how are grievances interpreted? Again, in the in the obviously in a legal forum, the court would again fall back on the Bolam Bolito principles and all those uh, uh, traditional uh, definition of medical negligence. But then are the facts relating to the injurious experiences fully and fairly exposed? Because you can't find experts who will possibly give evidence against other doctors who are their professional colleagues. So collegiality will kick in. So then again, the plaintiff is at an a disadvantage. I mean, even in the Priyani Soisa case, a doctor had to be brought down from England to uh, testify on behalf of the, uh, the patient, the claimant, right? But uh, so Priyani Soisa at that time, the Priyani Soisa was you know, one of the foremost pediatricians. Uh, so there was this professional collegiality. You want to protect your own. But on the other hand, I have found, I mean, I'm, I'm appearing in a medical negligence case. The doctor who the patient called, the claimant called, gave a very, very independent, he gave very, very independent evidence, which now I'm going to use to protect my clients, which, which, are, which are, who are government doctors. So you, you do find that sometimes this, it, you know, it can, it can uh, work the other way as well. And do prejudices of claims processing agent color the narrative of claim? So even judges, because we are all laymen in terms of medicine, I mean, the lawyers and the judges, we also have a particular perception of the medical sector or the healthcare service sector. And we think, you know, doctors do know more than us. They, they must have possibly done everything. We also know the difficulties in the public health care system. So you have these prejudices which might kick in, which should not ideally in a judgment should never kick in, but nothing is ever subjective, objective in the end. Uh, so that clinical content then becomes interpreted in this mass of other, other variables. And the focus shifts from the claims content to the inter-party relationship because it becomes an adversarial process. I mean, this is a problem in most of our cases. It's not, a fa not about fact finding, it's about ego. It's about winning a case. Uh, and then the claims goals, as I say, don't represent the claims outcome, are not represented in the claims outcomes because you wanted to prevent negligence. You wanted an explanation and an apology. But what you get is possibly rupees and cents or nothing at all. Uh, and then, therefore, the public interest concerns of wanting to improve the healthcare sector are never really, uh, never really materialized at the end of a court case unless that uh, the 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 judge, uh, judgment will lay down explicitly that these these aspects need to be improved. Of course, I have to say now judgments are emerging in that uh, in that direction, which is good. Then we'll be eye open for the healthcare sector in the years to come. So non-legal forums, I ask those same questions. Now non-legal forums, as I said, those are all uh, all situated in the medical sector because it's the Ministry of Health, it's the SLMC, it's the private hospital itself. So they obviously are going to be prejudiced in favor of the doctor. So again, are not places where you will possibly find an independent uh, independent inquiry, I'm sad to say. Oh, well, well that is what certainly patients uh, perceive the claimant's, uh, uh, claimant's uh, experience, right? So none of this is my opinion. I, 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 I've come to findings based on what others had to say. So I'm not going to delve into that much because it's on the same lines. As you can see, the same questions are asked, but looking at these non-legal forums. So... Uh, Madhuanti, I have five minutes to wrap up. Yes, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So just to conclude, uh, healthcare service standards, as I say, they are a combination of the clinical and the non-clinical. Uh, experiencing breaches of standards are driven by features of the patient community, not really nothing to do with the standards themselves. The party identity is there throughout the dispute journey, depending on the kind of person who's claiming the next step that you take might differ. Then adverse party responses, the hospital's responses, the doctor's responses are a part of the problem. Uh, managing grievances are a response to post-incident factors. It's about how doctors react to an adverse event rather than the adverse event itself. Then pursuing goals are demand really for better quality of care. Making claims is easier said than done. Claims processing forums, are, are they processing or adding or subtracting from medical negligence? 
and finally claims outcome, do they meet justice, claims goals, or quality of care, or none at all? So I reflect in the last chapter of the book that what my research and what the book ultimately does say is that, yes, we need to improve our healthcare service standards, uh, certainly where non-clinical standards are concerned, improve grievance redress systems, and for somebody who is in that sector, in the legal system, this is really important because otherwise we are going on parallel journeys and nobody wins a case because the ultimate outcome doesn't satisfy anybody and then improving coordination between institutional stakeholders to actually take cognizance of what has gone wrong so that you can better it. So to share that information, if it comes out of one forum, to share it with the other so that the entire systemic errors can be uh, avoided. So I say there is sufficient empirical support to demonstrate that medical negligence claims contain understandings and explanations of concerns about healthcare services, both clinical and non-clinical, that at least even a few claims navigate their way through difficult paths to respond to such services, that claimant goals constitute demands for addressing healthcare service issues, and that claims processing forums and their outcomes have the potential to improve the quality of healthcare services and hold service standards to account. Uh, of course, since the book, there are a number of other developments, and I think it's important that this is a book reading and this is not part of my book. Uh, so as you know, during the, uh, when the Priyani Soisa case uh, judgment came out, we didn't recognize what we call sentimental loss. So if there was no pecuniary loss, that is no financial loss cost uh, or pain or suffering caused by the, by the act of medical negligence, for lack of companionship or the love that you lost because of the death of a person, you could not claim that in a, in a civil action. But then we brought in a statute in 2019, which now provides for that loss to be claimed. So now beware doctors, in addition to the normal other, other uh, heads of damages, this is also something that can be awarded. And then of course, we had a, another Supreme Court case uh, in 2000, I mean, it was 2011, but decided in 2018, which uh, looked at uh, the duty of a hospital to provide staff, all qualified staff. Normally, we look at only the individual adverse event, but not the systemic errors. But I think this is an important judgment that uh, doctors also ought to read. And, more, and, and, and last, of course, I refer to the district court case judgment. Uh, but I think I want to leave you with this third judgment. This is a Supreme Court case. Uh, filed, uh, and it, it's, uh, it's formulated in the sense of almost a fundamental right, uh, where medical negligence has been couched in that framework. So it's interesting to see leave to proceed has been granted and the application is pending. So that is something which would be seminal if something comes out of this. So we must keep our eyes and ears open uh, to see uh, how that pans out. So I hope you, I don't know how, how many of you have read my book already, but I hope I haven't bored you to that death that uh, discouraged you from reading it. But I do encourage you to read it because I, I didn't really read much from it because it, it, uh, I think I would leave it up to you. It's, there are some of it which, which is very academic and may not be interesting reading when I read it aloud. But as I read snippets of it, of what people have to say about you, about us, uh, about all our professions, I think it's interesting reading because uh, it is a critical analysis and I hope serves for the betterment of both our sectors, the medical and the legal. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pereira, for that very informative talk. And I think it's an eye-opener for all of us, especially uh, uh, to uh, sort of uh, how simple empathy and communication skills goes a long way to avoid most of these uh, cases of uh, negligence. Um, so there are a few uh, uh, questions in the chat box also. I would probably go through one by one. Uh, uh, actually, uh, one of them is asking, it's a very useful book for medical officers from where we can buy this book. <laughs> I think uh, you better answer that question. <laughs> uh,
I think we can't, we can't hear you. Uh, probably. Sorry, I had muted myself. It's unfortunately available only in two bookshops in Halsdorf. That's the Bar Association bookshop and the MD Gunasekhana at Halsdorf. But if anyone is interested in through your uh, club or through the CCP, if you want, I can directly give the books because I get no royalties from it. I have already paid for it to my publisher in India. So before I give the books to the uh, book distributing the bookshops, I can, if, if, if there are a number of copies, I can sell it directly to, uh, to whoever wants it. Okay. It's thanks, uh, 2000 rupees. Okay. And uh, that's another question. How often would you see gross medical negligence claims in criminal courts? Are damage typically awarded? No, so in a criminal court, there won't be damages. So it will be a case of, uh, I mean, of, uh, it'll be a punitive, uh, pun uh, it's, the punishment will be punitive. So uh, very few, because as I said, the degree of proof is very high. And again, even the police, I mean, we have issued a circular that before you go to, if you, before you charge a doctor, that police definitely ought to consult the attorney general. So that degree of professional collegiality uh, with the legal and the medical profession is also there that people don't just take doctors to court. Yes, again, it's the same thing. Like, is it possible to go to police stations to lodge a complaint without going to the places that uh, had been mentioned? Yes, that was done by several of the complainants, the claimants that I, uh, claimants that I interviewed. Uh, but, but the police investigation is something far more, uh, it'll, it's more difficult really to follow through with that. So a civil claim is possibly better. But uh, as I said, if the police get, get a complaint like that, inevitably before they charge the doctor, if they find something, it will be referred to the Attorney General's department. And um, this is, of course, I think it's a comment rather than a question. Uh, so this is not comment. Uh, medical negligence is an issue. There should be rules and laws for the protection of public. And there are hundreds of other services essential for people, but never heard of negligence cases uh, or laws against those. And he has uh, mentioned some of the uh, things that you want to mention, ju judicial negligence, political negligence, religious, banking, treasury, administrative, trade, police, army, etc. So any comments uh, regarding that? Yeah, so professional negligence, I mean, the legal stand is the same. So if, let's say if it's like even an architect gives a design which is defective and the house falls down. It's, it's professional negligence. So you sue along the same line. So that same degree will apply according to the accepted standards of that particular profession. Uh, but yes, it is, it is rare, possibly, as I said, difficult to prove the same, same uh, uh, obstacles will apply because you will need other experts who have to come from the same profession and testify against colleagues. So perhaps that's what... Uh, uh, that's what uh, demotivates people. But if it's, I mean, not negligence, but administrative fault certainly can be sued because that's under pub public uh, public law and fundamental rights actions. So it doesn't have to be negligence, but if somebody, uh, yeah, is um, has done something wrong in that sense, that that is available that avenue. Uh, and uh, another question: Did you look into the mechanism placed in other countries to correct? systemic errors involved in medical negligence cases. Can you comment on this aspect? So, I mean, hospitals have, I'm sure even in Sri Lanka, you have this reporting, monthly reporting um, or mortality reporting mechanism, uh, reporting uh, meetings, right? And, and you collect the data and see what's gone wrong. And that's where you really learn about how to, how to avoid it happening again. Uh, but that's why I say it must never be treated as something uh, that you must suppress, but you must welcome perhaps some of these claims so that they come into the open and you can deal with it. Uh, so that's why I always, and that is the approach that a lot of Western countries uh, advocate, that is open, openness, so that uh, there's transparency and you tell the truth so that, uh, you, uh, that the institution and the service can be improved. Um, and actually, they're asking for your email in case that they want to get a copy. Is that possible? Um, yes, but uh, perhaps if they uh, maybe directly approach you, Madhuvanti, and then I can give the number of, otherwise I would have to individually yeah. uh, deal with uh, 
yeah, I would rather that. I mean, I have no problem sharing my email, but if it's for that purpose, uh, I think that would be the better course of action. So if you want to get a rough number of the copies that are required, I'll just get it over to you, hand it to wherever your office is. We can, uh, we, we can ask them to contact the CCP office. Yes, yes. But otherwise, um, I know that Gunasena uh, Halsdorf, if anybody, I, I hope doctors don't have to go to Halsdorf because that would be for obvious reasons that they go there. Uh, it's available there. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, anybody else who is willing to ask any questions, who is having some burning questions, can ask. Uh, uh, we can unmute if we want. Uh, if you uh, this want. is Arusha. Uh, is it possible for me to speak? Uh, Madhuanti? Yes, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Avanti, thank you very much for a most interesting and a fascinating talk and taking us through the book and highlighting so many different aspects. I think uh, we can really sit and think about the contents of uh, what you found and you know how to move forward from there. Uh, my question is, uh, now in the UK, what I have noticed is people sue the National Health Service. And Sri Lanka, mostly I have seen people sue individual doctors. Uh, but I think the last case where the district court awarded 30 million yes. or whatever was actually the against the head. You know, Secretary, health... Ministry of Health, yeah. yes. Exactly. So what, what, is the, what is this difference that we are seeing? Is there any reason for that? Uh, you know, any your ideas on that? I'd, I'd value so that. in the case itself, the judge mentions uh, that they didn't, as I said, it was the problem. They didn't know the names. She says one would not, patient may not know the names of the doctors. So uh, ultimately, vicariously, it's the hospital administrator and then finally the secretary, Ministry of Health. Who is responsible and if it's a public officer under our civil code or uh, civil procedure code the attorney general steps in if a public officer is named so even if it's a secretary minister of health the attorney general is named in his place so that's why it's very it, it's much easier if it's a government hospital to sue that way even if you don't know the name because ultimately uh, the state will take that responsibility and in, of course if the doctor is found to be negligent and vicariously the state has stepped in uh, in place of the doctor to recover that money you would have to then have a disciplinary inquiry under the establishment's code and recover the money that the state pays does that answer your question uh, thank you thank you Amanda. yes that that uh, does answer just another yes. uh, one one more one more perhaps uh, comment and an observation now, something which has developed, I think, after you did your, your research, uh, nowadays, I think the, the, may, the biggest problem that doctors will face in such an instance will be a trial by social media rather than a court of law. You know, like that can be uh, because in a court of law, a doctor would feel that he would get a fair hearing and, uh, you know, uh, he will be given an opportunity to present his side of the view. And, but of course, presently what happens is when you are being trialed by social media, well, nothing is left by the time the, you know, the social media campaign is over. So what uh, do, you, do you see? Uh, I mean, I think the reason why people probably go to social media is because it's very easily accessible and a court of law would, would, would have such high, uh, such high uh, standards which I expected. I'm just wondering, out of all those reasons that you said in this study, why people seek have compensation, uh, sort of medical negligence claims, why do people go to social media? Where does that fit in with those reasons? I mean, you, you very nicely put about five five reasons, but yeah. uh, where where do social media uh, complaints take them? I'm just, I'm obviously it's not compensation, but it's something else. No, so that is, so one, one could be prevention of recurrence if they feel that you, you distribute that place enough that at least they will, uh, if, if it is in fact true that they will do something to improve, if it's an institution, let's say institution that's named like they say this hospital didn't have the facilities or whatever. I mean, I know because I, I do animal welfare work, a vet, a vet, a, a, a private vet has been uh, dedicated in social media uh, because another way then found that. It, so it's, it's the same thing, really. But it, I think the how to prevent it would be because uh, 
preventive is possible. I mean, they approach social media, they get to that step because there has been a breakdown in communication before that, right? Why do they feel that they'll get justice or that forum in social media? Because the hospital has, or the doctor has probably not explained or given them that communication-based response, right? I'm thinking. Yes, I just just uh, uh, some I'm sharing some random thoughts with you. I mean, for instance, there is an ethical duty of candor which we speak about. Exactly. Is, yes, I've I've written an article on that as well. It's, it's Naylor versus Preston. Yes. Yes, but only I think one of the reasons why why doctors actually shy away from the duty of candor is if you do admit that you've made a mistake, and next you know, like by next morning you might have. You know, some very uh, prominent social media uh, personality interviewing the person and says, "Yeah, yeah, because you know, the social because social it, it's it's I think very difficult to 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 seek justice for somebody through social media if you feel that you've been aggrieved." So uh, one of the reasons why people I feel shy away from the duty of candor is uh, is is uh, well, is a need to avoid a. Uh, trial by social media. Uh, but I think, you know, a mistake, not every mistake is negligence, right? So it's how you explain it, right? And um, I mean, there's misadventure, but it's not negligence. That, that threshold. So it's about how you communicate. You don't have to say, you know, I should have done this and that's why. But, if, but you can explain perhaps with as, possi uh, as uh, untechnically as possible what went wrong. But that doesn't have to be your mistake. Something could have gone wrong, but it may ne not necessarily be negligent. So, but you can apologize on behalf of the system that this was unfortunate. So I, I think it really boils down to communication. I mean, I don't know from what, what I see. I mean, even in this that case that I mentioned about the vet, it, it, it was simply because they didn't ex explain. So they felt that they had been cheated in that sense. Uh, if the approach to what had gone wrong was different, I perhaps they would not have taken to social media, but I do, I mean, social media, everybody, I mean, I'm not even on social media for that it's the same reason, because it's a place where you can't, you know, divide, uh, find the difference between the truth and the untruth. And then it became, comes this naming, blaming um, game uh, between two, you know, it becomes an ego battle. Uh, so I think that only way really to avoid any of this is how you respond, how you respond if something does go wrong. I mean, if it's negligence, then, I mean, if you admit that it's negligence, then of course the person is entitled to something. But if you feel it was not negligence, but something short of that, then the, how you explain it and apologize in a way. Uh, I mean, even in the duty of candor, saying, uh, admitting or apolog apologizing doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you are guilty of negligence. Thank you, Amati. Just one final thing. Over did Dr. Shafi's cake case fall under medical negligence at any time or was it something else this is it dr Shah was, uh, yeah but they took it to uh, it was in a that would now his the accusation against him was forced sterilization right yes or, or doing something uh, uh, without consent wasn't it yes yes yeah so but that would then fall within which I don't think we've ever had a case like that is battery in it, under English law because you that is involuntary treatment because you have bodily autonomy and if somebody does that so that that is a, it's a slight sort of a subspecies not so much negligence but what you call a claim of battery assault sort of okay thank you Um, I think we just had a very fruitful discussion uh, or on this topic, uh, and I should thank Dr. Avantipara again uh, for that uh, wonderful and in very informative uh, talk that we, we listened uh, today, tonight, and uh, and uh, and all the participants uh, for joining us and uh, the questions that you have posted here also led to a very good discussion. And thank you so again, uh, Dr. Avanti Pereira. And uh, on behalf of Ceylon College of Physicians, we would like to uh, thank uh, officially uh, for uh, sparing us your valuable time on a Sunday like this. 
and uh, elucidating us on uh, medical negligence, cases of medical negligence. Thank you so much again. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor. Thank you, Doctor. It was my pleasure. Thank you so very much once more. Thank you. Okay, good night. Good night.